This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by Questonomicon, a collection of quests for 5th edition coming soon to Kickstarter. Our friend Jacob over at XP to Level 3 wants in on some of that Kickstarter action, so he is making a compendium of adventures for 5th edition. Jacob's videos on YouTube are always funny and entertaining, so I'm sure we can look forward to more of that in the adventures he's putting out for 5e. So follow the links in the description below and keep your eyes peeled to XP to Level 3 and on Kickstarter for this upcoming project. And now, on to this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we're taking a deep dive on how to run skill challenges in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Skill challenges are something that was introduced in 4th edition Dungeons & Dragons, and we kind of wish we had seen something similar to it in 5th edition. It's one of those rare hidden gems that we think actually worked really well, and although some bits of it were a little clunky, the framework for what it represented in terms of an option for running non-combat encounters, this is actually something that we think has a place in 5th edition, and there's a few tips and tricks for implementing them. Say what you will about D&D 4E, it had a lot of flaws, and I probably wouldn't recommend it again, uh, but this was one of the best Dungeon Master's guides for general GMing advice if you can detang disentangle all the mechanical language of 4th edition from it. And I think that that was one of the biggest issues that DMs at the time of 4th edition and those who want to carry forward the mechanics of skill challenges into 5th edition ran into problems with. Because skill challenges as a way of running non-combat encounters are a phenomenal framework to use for really getting into making a non-combat encounter feel as rich and complex and interactive for the players as a combat encounter. The problem with it was that with the way it was presented in 4th edition really kind of made skill challenges boil down to, okay, who in the party has the highest skill bonus? And let's just have them smash that skill button over and over and over again. But if we approach the ideas of 4th edition with a little bit more nuance and the mindset of 5th edition, we can get something really, really awesome that adds a lot to our games. So let's go into the do's and don'ts of implementing skill challenges into 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. There's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. If you've never heard of the phrase a skill challenge before, fundamentally a skill challenge is an encounter under which the player characters must achieve an objective. But it's usually not a combat-based one. A skill challenge might be something like a tense negotiation, or the party trying to work together to stop a magical ritual before it goes off, or disarm a very complex trap. But skill challenges have also been used for exploration scenarios as well, such as when the player characters must cross a dangerous wilderness, or navigate some sort of other situation where they're not going to be fighting monsters, but there still is a risk of danger and failure that is present. Regardless of the skill challenge that you find yourself in, the general principle is the same. The player characters are going to use their skills and abilities and roll several dice over the course of the skill challenge and try to accumulate enough successes to overcome the challenge without accumulating too many failures. For example, the player characters might need to achieve five skill check successes before they accumulate three failures. I generally start with the rule of three myself, of three successes before three failures, uh, which incidentally is exactly the way spells like flesh to stone and even death saving throws work. So if you understand how a death saving throw system works, or the spell like Flesh to Stone, you understand basically what you're gunning for here. Over the course of several rounds or turns, you don't normally have to use initiative for a skill challenge. The player characters are gonna to contribute to a pool of successes, but their failures are then going to also be counted up. It's really easy to track. You can track it basically in the same way that you would do death saving throws on a piece of scratch paper. The key thing to making skill challenges interesting though is making it more than just the player characters playing a guessing game over which skill is used in this scenario and then just rolling the best or highest skill repeatedly over and over again. 
which is what a lot of fourth edition encounters did, which is why people didn't like them in fourth edition. I think one important thing to bring to fifth edition skill challenges is the inclusion of all the players at the table. And simply as one person attempts to solve the problem presented to them, you ask the other players what they would like to do to contribute as well. If it's a negotiation, one thing that we like to do is if one player is doing the talking, we look to the other players and say, is there anything you'd like to add? Even if you're not rolling initiative, the key idea here is to still use turns and give every player a turn to contribute. Also, being open to what it is that they are presenting as their contribution. This might open up a possibility for skills that maybe you hadn't considered, but if they give a viable option on how they're going to contribute to the situation, asking for the appropriate skill check that might be different than the other players at the table lets everybody play into their strengths. But either way, you want to kind of have an idea on the skills that might be appropriate for this challenge. You might make a list of skills that the players can use during the skill challenge. For instance, if we are doing a skill challenge where the player characters must discern some sort of magical phenomena, obviously Arcana is going to have an impact here. But we might also say that this has some sort of significance with the gods, and so we'll allow religion checks to be used as well. I make a brief list of what the primary skills the players are going to be using in the skill challenge are, but I always try to keep an open mind if the players come up with something creative, and so I try to think of a few other secondary skills that might be possible as well. The secondary skills that you have in mind may grant advantage to another player's attempt to do a primary skill check. Or you could have it grant a success, but you don't want more than half of the successes be made up of secondary skills. The last option here is there might be some skills that are risky skills. Risky skills can grant a success, but if they fail, there might be consequences. These consequences might be that the next check the players have to make is made a disadvantage, or the players might suffer some backlash and take some damage themselves. Or finally, using one of these risky skills could contribute an additional failure if it has failed, or might even trigger a combat encounter or some sort of setback that has to be dealt with first before the player characters can continue. So when I'm preparing a skill challenge, what I will do is I'll make this list of what skills might be primary, what might be secondary, what might be risky, and I'll also take stock of what my player characters' spells and other abilities are. It might be possible that a player character decides to cast a spell in a skill challenge and that spell might grant an automatic success. If it's a real ace in the hole, maybe the spell bypasses the entire skill challenge. I'm open to this, but the players can have some creativity here. Again, they might decide, hey, there's a rocky avalanche that's coming down and they use a spell like plant growth or transmute rock and that's enough to quell the avalanche while they continue on. So that could work as an automatic success in those cases. Two other things to consider when you're creating a skill challenge for your players. First of all, you don't necessarily want to tell them that they're in a skill challenge, but you do need to give a good enough description that presents the players with the idea that they are entering something that will require their skills and abilities to overcome. So although you don't want to say, okay, you're about to enter a skill challenge where you need three successes in order to surpass the conversation you're about to enter, you don't need to do that. Just have the conversation start but then start asking for ability checks, what the other players are contributing, how they might be able to convince this NPC of what they're trying to convince them of, and now they're in a skill challenge without realizing it. One of those important ways to make a skill challenge feel like a dynamic encounter and an opportunity for player creativity is describing the environment in terms that give a clue about what skills the players might involve without hitting it on the nose exactly. For example, 4th edition often just recommended telling the players, yeah, in this skill challenge you can use arcana, nature, survival, and stealth. But you might want to be a little bit more nuanced than that and describe for your players the arcane runes and energy in the air feeling very palpable, like they might be able to tap into it or manipulate it. You might want to describe how the rocky cliff face has many 
handholds and footholds, or that they notice the loose stones and rocks in the castle framework that they might be able to punch through, or give them those other clues that, hey, there's ways that you can interact with the environment without saying you need to use this skill. And then when they use or perhaps suggest an alternate course of action of how they might interact with that environment in a way that isn't exactly using the skill you had in mind, be open to it, embrace it, but always ask them for a description of how they interact with the environment. Don't just let them say, I perception the room, or I stealth, or I use arcana. That's not exciting and it's not evocative. So to help represent the way to implement skill challenges into 5th edition, we're going to present three examples. They are going to be different examples that use different types of skills and are open to different ways for the players to engage with them. Through these three examples, we should get a clear idea of some great skill challenges to use in your games. The first example is, I think, the classic and the most recognizable example of a skill challenge, which is the social interaction negotiation scenario. This is when the player characters are dealing with a noble or a council of wizards, or perhaps a powerful cleric or even a dragon. And they are trying to bargain with this entity in good faith to arrive at some kind of agreement or get some sort of permission or maybe just talk their way out of being executed. In this example, let's first talk about our primary skills, secondary skills, and risky skills. Our primary skill is going to be persuasion. In this instance, the characters do want to convince the NPC to do something with them or for them. So because they're acting in relatively good faith, persuasion is going to be our key skill. If the characters are presenting great arguments and discussions, we want them to make a persuasion check. We might ask the other players at the table to contribute to this. What do you have to say? How are you going to represent the situation? And let each player have an opportunity to talk and present the case to the NPC. The risky skills in this case are going to be deception and intimidation. These are skills that might work out in these situations if the characters can nail it. But if they fail at these checks, it's going to be a bit of a faux pas. It's going to cause a blunder. It might damage the negotiations. So in this case, I'm just going to write in my note that if the players fail an intimidation or a deception check, they're going to have to address that before the skill challenge can continue. The NPCs that they're dealing with are going to get angry at being lied to or at being tried to intimidate. And so it might trigger a skill challenge within a skill challenge where the player characters have to cover up that blunder if they fail at the initial checks. For secondary skills, insight is a great option. Now you could add other secondary skills in here depending on the type of NPC they're dealing with. If it's a great wizard that they're talking to, you might have Arcana be a, a way that they can interact with them. One of the characters has high Arcana is able to talk about spells and magic on an equal level with this wizard. Or if you have a religious figure, then using something like religion. You could also be open to history or survival or any other skill that maybe a player character could talk about with this character on equal terms. I like to think of using the knowledge skills in a negotiation as the key negotiator being like, don't take my word for it. Here's an expert on the subject who's going to present a logical reasoning. And then the negotiator comes back in with the emotional argument once again. It's a very effective means of persuasion and it blends that kind of facts and feelings sort of argument that often wins people over in real life as well. Insight, in this case, can also be involved to help the players determine what path of reasoning they might use. Because this is where I like to get really nuanced with my negotiations. I don't use a set DC. Instead, the DC of the check varies by the quality of the player's argument. And I'm not necessarily looking for the players to um, drop out their most amazing role-playing or actually come up with a real persuasive argument. I'm just looking for them to come up with some sort of statement that shows that they're negotiating and that they're trying to think of what the other party in the negotiation is going to get out of it. So if the player characters come to me with a really, really good argument, the DC for their persuasion check might only be 10. If they're coming into it with some thought and it's a solid point, then it's DC 15. And if what they're proposing is a bit of a long shot and there's they're kind of stretching it, 
then it's DC 20. And by varying the DC, I acknowledge the player's creativity and thought in the social interaction. This is a great place where using something like insight or one of the other secondary skills can help the players kind of figure out the right path to take in their negotiations. This also might help give advantage to the negotiator on their next attempt at persuading the NPC. And then finally, for any negotiation, you'll also want to think about how spells like suggestion, detect thoughts, or charm person might throw things for a little bit of a loop. <laughs> So this is one example. If the characters accumulate enough successes, three, five, or whatever you think is appropriate, they they get to convince the NPC of what it is they were trying to convince them of. On the other hand, if they come up with three failures, the NPC thinks they're full of hot air and isn't going to listen to any further arguments from them. Now, if we move on to a different example, let's bring it to more of an exploration type scenario. In this scenario, we're looking at something like searching for clues or for something specific in the wilderness, or maybe investigating a crime scene. Obviously, in this case, our primary skills are going to be investigation and perception. The player characters are searching an area, they are looking for clues, and this could be an area that is as large as an entire mansion or a castle, or as small as an individual crime scene. It can be very abstract in this case. In this instance, we might not have any risky skills. The characters are kind of freely navigating and exploring and investigating. There's not really any chance that they're going to damage the situation using a skill check. Instead, the risk is that they just might miss something. But of course, we do want to allow some secondary skills to work here that might reflect the player's expertise. This is where, again, we can bring insight into play, as well as any of the knowledge skills, but I also like to look at the character's tool proficiencies as well, and maybe they have some sort of expert knowledge that means that, yeah, when they're looking at the kitchen, they can see things are out of place because they're proficient in cook's utensils. Maybe because they are proficient in smith's tools or mason tools, they can see problems in the area that are related to those skills or professions that someone else who's not proficient in those things might not pick up on. I also think that if they are exploring a wilderness environment, that using things like nature and survival are going to be key instruments that you could allow a full success or at least help with the investigation. Now, with a search or an investigation, this is where I actually change the model of how many successes and failures that the players need to accumulate. Instead, each player, we go around the table and each player decides on one course of action they are going to take, and each player is only going to make one role in this situation. And instead, the number of successes determines the final outcome. If the player characters only get two successes, well, they only find two clues. But if they get four, they find four clues. And what I can do in this case is actually escalate it and make it cumulative. So the more successes they accumulate, the more clues, the more information, the more treasure they find. On the flip side of this, the amount of failures that they accumulate could also cause problems. If they accumulate enough failures, perhaps they stumble upon an enemy hideout or a monster roaming around the wilderness. There could be other dire situations or they lose a clue or damage it in some way that makes it unreadable. So whereas in the first example, we varied the DC. In this case, the number of successes and failures has multiple different outcomes that could occur that get better the more successes the players achieve. As we move on to our third example, let's look at a different scenario. This is where a group of players are dealing with an arcane machine of some sort. There's both mechanical and magical elements that they need to interact with. Maybe they're trying to disarm a trap or come to understand what this machine is doing. This is your classic bomb disposal scenario. So this is one of those ones where often I like to add a timer to the situation instead of having an outright failure condition. So the players get three rounds to disarm the ritual or disarm the bomb or stop the machine before it goes off. And so in this case, their failures are just costing them time and opportunity. Our primary skills, if it's a magical machine of some sort or something involving magic, will definitely be arcana. If there are pieces to work with that are machinery based, we might look at sleight of hand or the use of thieves tools or tinkers tools or other tool sets that might be appropriate. Now, depending on the nature of the construct or what you've made, you might even allow something like investigation or religion 
to play a part in this thing. Or maybe it is a completely biological, druid-created arcane artifact, and we allow the nature skill to come into play, or perhaps even survival. In this case, every skill is risky because you can always play into the fact that you could have an arcane backlash out of failure. Yeah, the players are meddling with a delicate arcane ritual and messing with it improperly is personally dangerous to them individually. So this is a case where the backlash plus the timed condition really makes that adds that level of nuance to the success or failure conditions as well. And oftentimes you can even make this uh, communicate to this to the players because there might be an arcane rune that's ticking down or a fuse that's blowing across or something that tells them that the situation is getting worse. Maybe even you combine the situation with a combat encounter and a failed skill check summons a magical creature from another dimension that is added to the combat encounter. When we think of secondary skills, again, be open to your player's creativity. But also, this might be a great time for their spells to come into play. If they have a certain spell like Dispel Magic that could just undo the arcane abilities of this machine, allowing the rogue to then tinker around with their thieves' tools unharmed by the magical properties, that could be a great case for nullifying parts of this skill challenge. But also, I think that uh, there are several opportunities for skills to come into play here, depending on what your players present. Yeah, perhaps one of your players notices that the machine or the ritual is summoning extra planar creatures. And they say, well, I want to cast banishment on the ritual itself. And that means that for the rest of the turn, they don't suffer the consequences of failure on their skill checks. Or maybe a player character uses Counterspell to respond to the backlash. Maybe you have Dispel Magic or Remove Curse act as an automatic success counted towards the total, not just automatically undoing the entire skill challenge though. You could also use skill checks that allow them to interact or understand the type of machinery they're interacting with. Something like an investigation or a, a history role might give them insight into maybe an instruction that they found, or maybe there's instructions written in a different language that one of the player characters can read and try to decipher. Maybe the player characters aren't even on a huge time pressure, and this is an instance where they could use ritual spells like Detect Magic or Identify or or even other divination spells to help them unravel the mystery of the arcane ritual as they go through it. So it doesn't a turn in a skill challenge can be an abstract thing. It could be something that the players accomplish in one round, it could be something that they do in one minute, but it could even be something that takes them an hour to do. So time doesn't have to flow in the same way that it does round by round in a combat encounter in a skill challenge. Each turn of the skill challenge can be something abstract and take more time than it would in a regular combat. So in all of these examples, again, the idea here is that you want to think of the primary skills that your players are going to use to interact with the challenge, the secondary skills and the uh, risky skills, as well as spells and other abilities that might impact the situation. Again, always approach these situations with an open-ended mindset that allows your players to actually bring their creativity and their ideas to the table. By allowing them to come up with how they're going to interact with the situation and creating the skill challenge around that, you're kind of creating a situation where it's very open to the shared storytelling that happens in 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. And don't be afraid to mess with the model. Think about ways that you can use things like a variable number of successes, changing the difficulty class based on what the players suggest doing, or allowing them to use their spells and other abilities. All of these things are really, really relevant when you are focusing on the description of what is happening in the world rather than the raw mechanics. That's where 4th edition got it wrong. And so if you approach this with more nuance, allow more creativity into play, you'll find that skill challenges are a really powerful tool. And again, time and time again, my players are in skill challenges without even realizing it. Because as you practice doing this more and more, you learn that really a skill challenge is a fundamental way of presenting any sort of scenario in a role-playing game to your players. And it really helps get away from that binary success and failure that often happens in D&D, where players try to convince an NPC and they roll one persuasion check and think that one die roll is all they need to overcome it. 
Using skill challenges encourages your players to think about scenarios in a more complex way and lets those encounters breathe and become something that really becomes a centerpiece of a game. So this has been a look at running skill challenges in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Tell us about some of the ways you've implemented skill challenges in your games in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the work that we do here on YouTube, please consider joining our, our amazing community by following the links in the description below. And don't forget to check out our live play Shadows of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we have plenty more videos with lots of great advice for dungeon masters right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.